Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Layer by Layer, the show about 3D printing and our place inside the industry. Today, we're going to talk about our new Etsy plugin, the VoxelJet delisting from the NASDAQ, as well as 3D printed rocket motors, and maybe just a few notes about one of the worst clients we've ever had. But before we get into that, this video is sponsored by Audible. If you love books but can't find the time to read, Audible is your go-to solution. With thousands of audiobooks and podcasts, you can listen to your favorite stories anywhere and anytime. And here's the best part. By using our special link down in the bio, you can get an exclusive 30-day free trial, plus one free audiobook credit and two credits if you are already a Prime member. So why wait? Give Audible a listen today. Now let's get on with the video. So... Moving into the news for the day. All right. So the big one is uh, there was a test of Ursa Major's 3D printed rocket motor here this last week, and it went swimmingly. Uh, according to CEO uh, Joe Laurienti, it has only been about 24 hours now, so I'm still digesting it. Uh, but he was uh, looking really happy about it because their uh, 3D printed rocket engine had propelled a TA-1 uh, test bed up to nearly hypersonic speeds over the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this is a big deal because 3D printed rocket motors are still fair. Well, they're not that new. SpaceX has been using them on even like the Dragon spacecraft for a while. But this level of performance from a rocket engine is fairly new. Relativity has also done some things and that kind of stuff. But 3D printed rocket engines in a large performance context are still getting proven out and understood. They're a really obvious solution because rocket motors generally have a, a lot of complexity inside of them that is made so much easier by a 3D printed version. The technology really enables a whole bunch of really nifty capabilities that otherwise never would have been possible. I mean, rather than hand soldering thousands of small copper tubes along the bell of the engine, you just put the tubes into the model and it comes out and it's fantastic. Uh, since uh, most of the, the 3D printing processes that they're using anymore are able to work with like Inconel and that kind of stuff too, you can make a really good engine. Uh, this is a fantastic opportunity for the whole new space industry because the cost of creating a rocket engine is just falling through the floor. Even though 3D printing is still expensive, the fact that you can print a rocket engine from the design to where you don't necessarily have to have the, the skill, the labor to produce it, is a big, big deal. And you're gonna see a lot more of this stuff that the 3D printed aerospace components, especially around nozzles, obvious, obvious solution, obvious application for 3D printing. So there's that. Um, containerized drone factories, Firestorm Labs, founded by Ian Musius, formerly of Origin and Stratasys, aims to containerize drone factories. The company's gotten $12 million from Lockheed and others. Uh, to print the Tempest drone on location. It has a maximum takeoff weight of 25 kilos and a payload of 4.5 kilos. Uh, it's two meters long, two meters wide, uh, and they're shooting to print it in 24 hours. This is basically an MGF machine and all the post-processing stuff inside of a shipping container, all the parts and pieces for the drone. Again, really good application. Uh, you're able to knock out these reasonably low-cost uh, drones on location or knock out the spare parts for it. It's not really a new idea. Uh, a lot of people have done containerized 3D printing historically in the past. Heck, even we did it. Uh, four years ago, we were going for containerized print farms that would contain about 50 machines. And quite frankly, we thought that was how it, our, our means of distribution was going to go uh, when building out print farms around the country and world. Um, but it ended up being too small. But for military applications, Getting printing capabilities into a box that can just be dropped uh, is a really good idea and should should be done more often. I don't know why it hasn't caught off more caught on more readily inside of the military space. It's kind of an odd situation in that regard because it's it's an obvious solution. I think a lot of it has had to do with durability uh, in that you can't really take an MJF machine and drop it out the back of an airplane. The ruggedizing of it, I think, has been one of the main stop gaps because historically printing has always been a little bit finicky and you don't want to have to deal with something finicky out in the field. So there's that. Um, okay, let's see here. Uh, Voxel Jet to delist from the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. 
Voxel Jet, we've talked about a few times. They're losing a lot of money, um, had a bunch of shakeups, getting all reorganized, and they decided to delist from the NASDAQ to reduce expenses and therefore to further strengthen its financial position. It is super expensive to be a public company. The amount of paperwork you have to file and the number of lawyers that you have to have around to do it is kind of absurd in order to stay in good standing. So literally to just save quarter million, million, maybe $2 million a year or something to just not have to deal with it is a smart move when the company's hurting as badly as it is. <coughs> the reason you would go public in the first place is to raise money in that you sell some shares of the company to the public uh, and then you get to use that money to do it. By the way, after those shares are first sold and they're just out on the market, they're useless to the company. So if the stock goes up the shares that you already sold, you sold at the initial price, so it doesn't really matter. Everybody else, all the stock traders and stuff are the ones making money. Um, so once you've sold the initial batch of shares, delisting, uh, continuing to be there if you're not uh, having an inflated stock price to where you can sell more shares at the higher rate isn't really useful. So it makes sense that they're doing that. Um, and there'll be one less public company. <laughs> wandering around, of like the eight that are 3D printing public companies right now. Okay. Um, aside for that, that's the news. Oh, one comment on here. <laughs> Purchased news articles are a problem. So in, we, we discussed this a little bit last week in that there was no news articles that were like actual news. They were just company announcements. There, uh, this continues to be an issue, and I'm not going to call out any of the specific 3D printing news websites, but a number of websites are just inundated with effectively corporate spam. Like whoever, whoever just released amazing new material in partnership with whoever, that's, that's a, a purchased article. And these media companies or the com media companies that own these 3D printing websites, uh, sometimes it's the site themselves, sometimes it's not, uh, reach out to companies and say, hey, uh, would you like to promote your business on this website? You can purchase an editorialized article about your company and you pay the reporters to write the article. This exists in all of media, but it is recently, it's been very, very prevalent inside the 3D printing space to where there's, and I get it. I totally get it. There's not a lot of new news out there, except for the fact that we just did some cool stuff last week. But the, uh, there's not a lot of 3D printing news out there. So I get needing something to pay the bills. So if someone's gonna pay you to write an article about their news, uh, you take it. But it creates a very low quality reading experience where I think somebody could probably create um, a version of the news that is more condensed and only, well, as I say that, that's what we do. We find the, the three articles that are interesting each week, and we talk about those here on the podcast once per week. Um, but to be fair, we're not trying to make a living doing the news. So that's an unfair comparison. But um, there are several th uh, 3D printing news organizations that do a really good job and do actually true news and reporting and information. And they, they do a really good job. But I would say like, Two out of the four primary news websites are just shilling very, very clearly. Um, so we're whining about that for really no good reason. And, I well, for good reason, but I get it. I understand how that comes to be. So I shouldn't whine about it too much. Um, okay. Uh, announcements. Etsy. Etsy, 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 Etsy. Actually, let's hold off on Etsy for just one minute. The new Etsy plugin came out last week, and I'm going to go through a few of the questions here that haven't already come out. But before that, filament. We got the parts in for the extruder to get it up and rolling. So we uh, are going to, uh, the team is going to work on it this weekend, literally. Um, it may be running literally as the show goes public. Um, but we're going to get that all plugged in and working and presuming everything goes swimmingly and those parts are the only parts that are shot or whatever else it was um, and not just indicative of, I don't know, a fuse blowing or something like that. Um, they should be good to go. So the uh, we will get filament production running. All of next week we will be running out production. So 4kg spools will start shipping next week. Um, again, if all the fixes go well. And from there, we will open it up and start uh, having filament readily and continuously available. So we'll get past this batch requirement and just have stuff ready to ship all the time. 
Uh, we are also still working on getting the second extruder in. Uh, we've closed a deal uh, with uh, the the machine owner, and we're going to get another one of those in, which will help us scale up, add in new materials, and uh, do everything that we need to get done there. So we will get that. It'll it'll still take like a month and a half to get it shipped over here, wired in, set up, debugged, so on and so forth, all the things. But it's in a really good spot right now. Um, we're very, very excited about that because that'll um, increase, it'll double production for Tangled and we'll go into standard workflow with everything else that we have. Um, so that is filament. Filament's in a good spot. Uh, once we have those two extruders up and rolling, uh, we should be able to do another price decrease and get uh, US made filament down below $15. A uh, little bit behind on the pricing for the, uh, where am I going with it? For US made or, or from the master plan. But the master plan is still in really good shape. We've hit most of the price targets aside from this delay. And we're on track to finish up and get to ten dollars, probably even before the end of this year, um, if we're if we're if everything's going well, going really well. Okay, the Etsy plugin. The Etsy plugin has launched. Version three of the Etsy plugin has launched. Uh, there have been a lot of revamps to it. It is faster. It's cleaner. Uh, it's got better feedback. Um, it connects to Etsy better, which, by the way, w was difficult. <coughs> Etsy as um, a software partner, it's difficult. Um, but it's a public API and we get access to the API, so that's fine. It's just, it's, uh, 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 uh. yes. Um, I shouldn't, I shouldn't rumple feathers on that all, but uh, not, uh, never mind. Go on, never mind. But anyhow, the Etsy app is up and around. Uh, so now uh, going through it, you are able to upload a file connect it, uh, match it to one of your product listings. And as soon as one of those product listings is ordered, we will print and ship that item directly to your customer. Baseline specs for y'all uh, that we go through in, in the various videos and should be on the site. Uh, point to resolution, 20% infill, PLA, black, white, and gray colors, solid colors. We do not do multicolor printing. Processing time right now with the demand that we've got for it is about three to five days. Uh, so if you're doing your Etsy product listing, just say three to five days for processing time. Shipping is calculated and billed at the time of shipment uh, because there, there's no way to know how, how much it costs to ship the item. Because if you're going to a different spot, it costs differently. If it's going next door, it costs different. Um, so there's no way to quote shipping until the customer actually makes the order. Because if it's going to Alaska, it's going to cost different than if it's going here or if it's going international. Uh, there is international shipping on it. So you are able to, uh, if you're in the, the point of origin of all orders is our US uh, Boise based mega farm. So that's where all Etsy orders are running through right now. So they will ship from there. Uh, we can ship internationally. And then yeah, that's pretty much it. So that, that'll that get you basically part in your customer's hands within about seven days at the latest, generally. And uh, we partnered with USPS for all of shipping. Um, so we will automatically default to the lowest cost shipping option. Uh, there's no expedited shipping yet. Um, but that's pretty much the overview of it all. Yeah, the Etsy app is a really, really cool thing because now you you don't have to have a printer farm in order to have a printer business. You can have a 3D printer and prototype parts and verify your designs and that kind of stuff and then just move them over to us and we take care of the the, the logistics of scaling up. So you get a good really a really good design, you can deploy that like deploying an app. Like you have the local version on your computer that you test with and then you deploy it to the app store. We give you the infrastructure to have either 10 machines or 100 machines supporting whatever your product is. So you're able to scale up without dealing with it. It's also really, really cool for international stores that don't want to pay for international shipping. So if you have an Etsy store in Europe and you want to deliver to the U.S., you can just plug in the Etsy app for U.S.-focused uh, listings, and then we would print and ship to the U.S. customer. So the U.S. customer doesn't have a, a really expensive international shipping bill, or you have an international shipping bill if you're doing free shipping. <coughs> 
so that improves everything for everybody. It's a it's a really cool piece of tech. Um, so we will and we will be expanding it here very soon. We'll be releasing the API that supports the Etsy app, so other people can build applications on top of that. And then uh, we do have on the roadmap Shopify, but again, we're releasing the API first. So if someone else wants to build a Shopify app. Totally can. We're good with that. We won't even compete with you. If you build it and it's good, we'll 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 invest in you or something like that. I don't know what all. We'll partner with you, help you out. We're totally down for that. Um, so yeah, th this is about getting more people to use three D printing for production of final products. Um, who has the, the 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 integration software and that kind of stuff is irrelevant because the whole pie is growing bigger if this all works. Um, and the big limitation to printing has been the limitation of scale to where you had to buy 20 more machines if you wanted to scale up. But now you're making your life more miserable because those machines are designed to print off a prototype. And now you have to pull parts every two hours and then restart every day and so on and so forth, all this stuff. Uh, questions about the Etsy app from our announcement video. There's a few comments there. Color, uh, we do not have multicolor, and right now the colors for your parts are limited to gray, black, and white. The reason for this is for the last couple of years, we have worked with a lot of Etsy stores, and the vast majority of sales, vast majority of sales are within those three colors. So if, you're, if you need chartreuse, purple, sparkle, um, there likely is not a huge amount of demand for it on the platform. So if that's where you're starting, it statistically... Products are doing better with these three colors, which is why we started there. We will be expanding colors over time, so through the primary colors, so like green, blue, uh, red, those will come available. We do not do multicolor printing. Multicolor printing introduces too many wrinkles in quality as well as communication of what needs to be done. Ship outside the U.S. Yes, we do. Uh, should be able to do that. Uh, it might be restricted to particular countries, so if you're... I don't know, some odd, you probably can't ship to China or something like that just because logistics or they won't let us do that, um, but that type of thing. Uh, we are shipping from the U.S., again, coming from our Mega Farm facility. Oh, third-party parts. A lot of people asked about this. Can we do heat inserts or throw a set of screws in the bag or something like that? Uh, no. Uh, the problem with third-party parts uh, with a print-on-demand application like this, is that we don't know where the parts go. And there's not a good way of defining where those parts go without having you submit drawings, which then our techs have to evaluate um, and interpret and everything else for a part that is affordable. Uh, a good 3D printed product should have no, should not be multiple parts and should not have uh, third party parts that have to be installed because there, there's no way for us to build a reliable factory workflow to where a thousand, think about this, we've got like a thousand Etsy stores connected to us. If each one of them has a part that needs a custom set of heat inserts put into it, each there are a thousand unique parts per day that have to have that done to them. It's just too slow and too cumbersome and would create a be too unreliable because there's no way to standardize across all of those parts to where a reasonable technician is able to just go bang them out and then pass the part on through. It's not obvious. So there would either have to be fundamental changes in design or a freaking augmented reality headset that says heat insert there, heat insert there, and so on and so forth. Um, so the best thing to do is to design threads into your part, um, upload it in the correct orientation, that kind of thing. Oh yeah, by the way, uh, side note, do make sure you're uploading your parts in the correct orientation. They don't auto-orientate. Um, it is on the designer to upload the part as it is intended to be. Um, so, uh, yeah, make sure that's occurring to make sure your part is uh, in the orientation that you want. We will make some adjustments if we see something just glaringly bad and we would reprint it and reship it. But again, when there's a thousand parts, guys, what, what we get is all that we see because um, we don't know what your intentions are. We're not able to read your mind and we try to restrict and control it a bit, but it is a requirement of the designer to have verified their part. 
Uh, in that regard, if you're wanting to see what your parts are and that kind of thing, do make sure to order your part from you the first time around to make sure that's good. And and you you pay yourself twenty bucks, and there's a whatever three percent fee off of it or something along those lines. Um, that allows you to then verify that the part you're making is correct, effectively a manufacturing sample. <coughs> okay, um, let's see here. Um, but yeah, there are no third-party parts right now. And that being said, we will add in controlled third-party parts. So we may will very likely add in like nightlight modules at some point in the future because again, a really high use case option. And that's something that we can just throw into the box or where every light is identical. It's like, here is the module, your nightlight has to fit with it. You can add in this module inside of the app to be included with your stuff. If that is the case, um, that is very controllable to where, oh, every nightlight has this module and nobody has to think about it. But we can't do full custom because it just breaks down the, the scalability. And in order to keep this affordable and reliable and good quality, uh, we can't have a lot of variation right now. Um, so we're focusing here on this core basic group, and then we'll start expanding it over time. Uh, Shopify app. Yeah, we're, we want to do it uh, when we get time and availability and bandwidth. Um, the Shopify app we really want to do. Uh, comment down below if you want the Shopify app. That we, we need a vote. We need a customer demand metric there. But the uh, but we again, within the sense of focus, the reason we started with Etsy is because there's a large 3D printing community on Etsy. It's the default place to go because Etsy has really good advertising resources and it's just very easy to get set up. Whereas Shopify is easy to get set up, but it's tough to advertise your site after you get it unless you already have a following. Um, so the uh, we started with Etsy because the, the user group was already there. It is certainly smaller than Shopify as far as a m total addressable market. Um, but it helps us be really focused with a group who understands 3D printing um, and has enough options to want to try it and that kind of thing. How is cost calculated? Oh, uh, so cost is calculated. Obviously, you have the print time material, that kind of stuff, uh, complexity of the part, uh, if supports are needed, that kind of thing. But there is a, a minimum cost. Uh, the minimum cost is uh, effectively the picking and processing cost. Like to pull a part off of the machine, put it in a box, pay for the box, so on and so forth, the human time of doing that, as well as the inspection step of looking at it and saying it's good. So that's a minimum. That is about a 3 to $4, depending on what the parts are. So if you have a single tiny part, it has no print time or material, it'll cost like 4 bucks. And then if you have two tiny parts, it'll cost like $4.10 because you just added on a little bit of material, but the baseline stuff is there. Uh, that Oh, this is a good point, too. If you need multiple parts for a single product, they have to all fit on the same bed. One print, one shipment. Um, so you have to create the STL with all of them grouped so they fit on our bed size, uh, 220 by 220 by uh, 310 maximum. It's best if you stay in a 220 cube. But because uh, there, there can be lead time delays with the taller, larger format ones. But the... Yeah, if you have multiple parts, make sure they're grouped on it. So like if you have the bottle and the lid, don't have them separate files, put them into the same STL file grouped together so that they print all at once and then you're good there. Um, and then there, yeah, that's that. So, and then pricing, there's that. Uh, we do also have a, a cap on total pricing because uh, it's just, there's weirdness in total pricing to where you can just like run away to where, and, and we'll adjust this. We, we may adjust the cap on it, depending on if somebody sends us freaking lattice tree, whatever else it was totally supported that somebody has to pick on for six hours or something like that, that we will make adjustments to the process if somebody's like gaming the system in that regard. Um, but right now there is a ceiling on the total cost of a part right there to where uh, we basically eat it if somebody goes beyond that. But we want to ensure that the cost to produce a part is reasonable and controlled to where you can create a, a, a consumer product off of this and get it made on demand affordably. Um, the ones we expect people to really do are a lot of cookie cutters, night lights, 
um, some gaming gear accessories, widgets, brackets, gears, those kind of things. Um, but that'll be the baseline for that. Okay. <coughs> I have a small cold. I apologize for that, guys. Alrighty. Discussion topic of the day. Our worst client ever. Uh, obviously not going to name names about this. Um, but... Worst client ever. There's different types of worst clients. There are clients that are difficult to work with, and then there are clients that are like, just screw you. The worst one is the ones that screw you. Um, if a client is difficult to work with, it is, it, it is the job of the organization to figure out either a workflow to better work with that client or better communicate with that client or um, not accept the client, just not continue taking work from them. So a miserable client is, is a different animal. Uh, clients that have screwed us, you run a business, you get screwed by plenty of people. It just happens. Um, sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes people steal from you. Sometimes people go out of business, whatever it was. Um, last year, we had a number of these. Um, I don't know why it was concentrated last year. I think it was kind of side effect of it all. But the worst client we ever had we were doing print on demand uh, for a fairly large client, a another small business like us, smaller business startup. Um, but they were a very fairly large client. We had worked with, we had brought them on, uh, started the, the conversation in the fall of 2022. Uh, and we signed a deal in January. Uh, the, the deal was we, we quoted the cost per part. And there would be some variance allowed inside of the parts because it was a custom, it was custom gear for people. So they would do a scan and then you would print the part. So like helmet shoes, those types of things. I'm not going to say the specific product, but a customizable 3D printed part uh, for wearables. Uh, we quoted what it would cost to print one of these off because there's no way to do auto quoting on variation and it's just more effort than it's worth. It's just like, here's a flat fee to produce that part. If it's bigger than we eat it, if it's smaller than you eat it and it all evens out at the end. That's the cleanest way of doing it. Of like each part costs a dollar, whatever it happens to be. Um, while this client was themselves fairly small, they were a fairly significant job for us. Uh, in the deal, we were required to store a certain amount of inventory of material to make sure that regardless of what their demand spikes were, we would always have every one of these colors available and a minimum stock of this amount. Uh, we then also guaranteed every part would ship within three days. Uh, here is the quality specs that we would hit, so on and so forth. Uh, and we signed it, they signed it. We said, this is how much it's gonna cost. The and it was good. We spent about two or three months going through, refining all the processes, making sure here's the QC process, that kind of thing. Here's the print process. How did you do this? How did you do that? Because we were effectively replacing their uh, print operations, which were not, uh, were not keeping up or they were wanting to di divest. Um, get it all set up, get it rolling. We purchase all the inventory, thousands of dollars of inventory. Uh, we do all this work and set up. We build effectively a little production line for their stuff. So they have the custom workflow that is definitely contained. We do quite a bit of investment. We got ourselves certified through their particular certification agency to make sure that our factory was up to spec. Um, all this stuff that was all specific to them. And it was part of the deal. It was baked into the deal. We would take responsibility for this and they would send these orders to us. Um, and they said, yeah, we're going to close it all there in 15. Um, we're going to move your production over to you next month, Gabe. I'm like, cool. Uh, they start moving some of the production over, and we start getting about half of their orders, and we run for a month. And everything goes fine. There were a couple of wrinkles, as you always have when you start up um, and are doing full shakedown in real world, because the amount of testing that you do, you never test every situation. And immediately, some customer or user throws a curveball at you. Um, the, to be fair, many of those wrinkles were in user flow because they were manually sending orders to us because they didn't have the software infrastructure to like automate it. So they would effectively email us an order 
and we'd have to ship it effect the next day. Um, but they wouldn't put the zip code in the message. And it's like, you shipped late, Gabe. And I'm like, we couldn't ship it. We emailed you on the day when people were packing up the box and they saw, oh, there's no zip code on this order that you sent over, that kind of thing. So that that was first little red flag of like, there was just operational deficiency on the other side um, to where we had the whole process, but if they don't use the process, it doesn't work. So, but they were small wrinkles though. It's like, oh, it shipped the next morning rather than that evening. Um, and we got to pay overnight. Uh, but we do this for a month and it's all going well. And yeah, we're getting better and we get up to flow and we're, we're hitting their demand uh, specs and so on and so forth. And quality is good, all the rest of it. I get a call from the CEO or no, I get an email from the CEO. You know how we signed the deal back in January that said it's going to cost this much for each part? Uh, she s- sends an email to me and she says, uh, hey, Gabe, uh, we need to make this profitable. I need the cost of these things to be half the price, which I was confused about. Um, I was confused about because she knew how much it was going to cost to make these things. Why did she sign the deal? Um, so that 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 was a big problem because we can't just immediately cut our price in half. That's not how it works. It, we weren't being super greedy about it all. The only way to reduce the cost of production was to either change their specs, change their workflow, or change save costs someplace else. I'm like, okay, well, uh, we can't cut price in half tomorrow. Uh, how about we, um, I, I see a roadmap to it. Like if you scale up to this, that's enough flow through to where I have a dedicated person and that gets a little bit cheaper. And then we can order a ton of this material because you're mainly using red. So that'll cut cost over there. Um, and if we're in flow, we can probably reduce uh, processing time so that we get them out in like 20 hours rather than uh, 36. So you don't have to do overnight shipping to get inside of your four day lead time or whatever it happened to be, that kind of thing. These parts were parts that required like 12 to 15 hours to print. So there's no way to turn them over the next day necessarily. Um, I was, oh, then that was the other thing. I was like, if you can get the orders to us earlier, like in the morning rather than the afternoon, that makes sure they're processed that morning so that they can actually maybe go into shipping the next day. Th- those adjustments, it's like, okay, to get to that goal, here are the shifts that need to be made. And I laid out that roadmap and I was like, okay, and we'll also have Texas opening up next year. So in like six or eight months, if you guys are there and your client set and ready to go and scaling up, then that justifies us accelerating Texas so we can build up a Texas plant so that your shipping costs decrease a little bit more. Um, And she sent me over a spreadsheet of her cost per, here's the cost of design, here's the cost of scan, here's the cost that the sales guy takes and so on and so forth. And I was like, can you squeeze that down? Because it seems like your cost of design is really high. <clears throat> and she effectively said, no, Gabe, it's all on you, um, which, okay, um, if it's all on us, here's the roadmap to start reducing cost. And I think I gave her a way to reduce cost by about 20% immediately by them just improving their process so we weren't emailing them for the zip codes. Like, okay, making our lives easier, can you just put this all in a packet and like send a Google form or something so we know every field is filled out, that kind of a thing. I will give you a deal for that to just make life easier. Um, And she said, no, can't do that. Um, But I gave all those options and did create a roadmap to reducing the cost by 50%, which is a giant reduction, especially when she already knew from the deal how much it was going to cost and somehow a month in discovered that it was unprofitable. She responded to that uh, message of roadmap and said, okay, Gabe, we're going to go with somebody else or whatever it was, see else. We're going to go and take over production with this other company that we found. I was like, excuse me? We have a signed deal where I have met my obligations and you have not met yours. You don't get to disappear. This is what I was thinking. This is not what I said at first. Uh, The first thought I had is, why is this happening? Why is this a shocker? Why is the price of the part suddenly an issue when it wasn't an issue six months ago? Like our prices had not changed. Our flow had not changed. We were delivering the things. I didn't know what was up. Um, So I started digging into the company and they had recently been crowdfunded. 
uh, equity crowdfunded. And to be equity crowdfunded, you have to form a number of SEC forms that show your historical revenue and how much money you have in the bank um, so that investors know what they're investing in. So I pulled up all of that data and I could see I could see that they'd been losing money for the last two years, as startups do. Um, and I know how much they raised from the crowdfunding campaign because they did, were successful. And I was like, oh, the math don't work for the company as a whole. Um, and based on I, I know how much money they spent because, again, she sent me over the spreadsheet of cost. I was like, okay, I know how many number things you make in a month. I know how many people are on your team. I am, I know a little bit about business, so I can kind of extrapolate how much money you have left in the bank from that big old cash infusion that you had. And I said, oh, they're getting to the bottom of money. And their, their board has just said, we got to cut costs which means that they look at the first guy who's the new cost and say, you got to cut cost. So I was like, oh, this is the reason this came up. I was like, oh, okay, I get it now. I understand now. I think I understand now why there's this sudden change of mind, even though nothing has changed. It's like there was a reminder that was very stark that they're going to run out of money. Okay. So I called her up and I said, hey, look, I, I see that you... I can see from your past finances on the Kickstarter that you're probably running out of money. Uh, let's not create a bad situation where you just screw us right now because that's effectively what they were doing. And I, I did say that. Let's not, please, we can't allow you to just cancel your contract because that's breach of contract. And I don't like breach of contract. I think people should meet their obligations. So I get ticked about that. I'm like, we don't want you to breach your contract. I understand that you're running out of money. How, look, we're willing to work with you. This is a really cool product. It should catch on. Maybe we can do a deal where we like effectively loan you work and you pay us back later until we get down to pricing. Um, or we can invest in the company or partner up in some kind of way, have a more of a strategic partnership than just a manufacturer and client relationship. Let's do these other things because it looks like you're running out of money from what I can see of your public information. Called her, left that voicemail. Um, I got a call back, and she she responded uh, that I was the most patronizing phone call she had ever received. And I don't think I had a tone on it. I try not to. I have no doubt that I was flustered about the situation. Um, but I also and I but I made clear that we can't allow them to screw us by going into breach of contract and then and but I offered options and I was looking for other directions to go um, but they were screwing us they had the deal and now they were just going to disappear cuz they felt like it and new things happened and I'm like you don't get to do that you have a deal with us um but she she was angry about my response and she was also angry that I, she, uh, part of the response was, oh, you don't know anything about my company. And I'm like, okay, explain it to me. I'm, I'm open to seeing what is not on your public data that you have to disclose to investors. Um, because yes, I embellished, I extrapolated, I had to kind of guess based off of last year's revenue. And, but it, it broke down and she, she, uh, the, the CEO would not respond to us at all. Um, and it was really unfortunate because it was a really cool project. We wanted to be a part of it. And we were doing everything that we could and, quite frankly, had been over backwards to that point, too. Um, but it completely evaporated. Um, and I, I don't like to call lawyers, guys, but we called a lawyer. It's, it's ridiculous to sue someone. It should be a last-ditch effort to sue someone. Two parties should be able to talk to each other. But... If it degenerates after the first call to you're patronizing because you researched my company and offered options, I don't have any other direction to go. So we ended up starting going into legal actions and that kind of stuff. And it, we never want to do this with clients because it's just it's bad form. Suing anybody is bad and you shouldn't do it. But screwing somebody is wrong and you shouldn't do it. Um, they had a deal. We had all this inventory, all of this investment, all of this loss right at that moment. 
um, that we couldn't justify just saying, ah, ah, shucks. I mean, it was a large project that we had invested in heavily because we believed in the partnership. Like we wanted this to work and we wanted to make what we could to make it work. They weren't paying us for those upfront fees. Literally on the, um, on one of the certifications or something, um, this is how bad of a businessman I am. The, um, the client said, we'll go ahead and get that done for you. And I was like, no, 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 we'll pay the bills for it. This is our responsibility as the factory. We need to, uh, this, is, this is our expense to get ourselves up to snuff to meet your needs. Um, so we took the hit on that, even though we didn't have to, we could have had them pay for it, um, and let them go deeper in the hole apparently. But anyhow, we had all this investment and then the client pulled the plug on us for no reason other than they wanted a better deal than what they had agreed to. And that just pisses me off. Um, so anyhow, it degenerated there. We called the lawyer, um, what was funny about it was is that ultimately we got to a point where the regardless of what the CEO said to me, um, from an operational standpoint, you cannot let emotion or anger get into you when you're operating a company or doing business. Um, talked to the lawyer. Uh, we sent over some of the first paperwork and that kind of stuff of like, okay, legal action is going to start proceeding here. Um, but then we got into a situation where it was very clear that this company was going to go out of business because they were just burning through money. Maybe they'll zombie for the next few years or something, but they, they didn't have the money and were losing money. And they'd been around for five years and they hadn't grown significantly. Uh, they thought they had a thing that was going to break them loose. But quite frankly, if a company doesn't grow over five years, there's something fundamentally wrong with the company. Uh, so... We got to the point where it just wasn't it wasn't worth the effort and the expense of suing them to sue them because we could see their financials. They didn't have any money. Even if we won, we wouldn't get any money. And all I'd have to do is pay lawyers. Um, I still wanted to do it because having a bad actor like that in the industry who moved from us to some other print farm who they're now going to go screw to because inevitably that's what's going to happen. If they do it once, they're going to do it again. I wanted to just get them out of circulation just to prevent this type of customer from existing that would kill and hurt other people. Because while we could take it in the teeth this one time, another company or startup starting up wouldn't be able to. And it would just be crippling to be bait and switched like that. Sign the deal and then just walk away and ignore the whole deal. It happens a lot. More often than you guys would, more often than should occur, but it happens. Um, but anyhow, so we went through all of that, um, and ended up just letting it be, um, and literally during the conversations when the lawyers called up the other CEO, there was just blatant lying about what had occurred. And it wasn't even like I said on the phone, she said on the phone or something like that. It was just like, here's the email that I sent. She said that I didn't say that I said something else. There's literally the message that I sent. Um, it was just an incredible amount of reality distortion on the other side. Um, but anyhow, so that that is by far the worst client experience I've or worst client we've ever had to where there was just this weirdness in the situation. Like, I understand somebody stealing from you. I understand the motivation for somebody going out of business. I understand uh, all the ways people will screw you. I understand miscommunications um, and misunderstandings and that kind of stuff. But this was just crazy um, or just fully, fully inconsiderate to where it's like, I'm professionally leaving you or whatever else it was. I'm like, no, you're not. You're screwing us. You're stealing from us. I was like, no, no, I'm allowed to or whatever it was. I'm like, no, you're not. Like literally nothing in any part of this says you're allowed to do that. Um, and you, yes. So yeah, that's the worst client. To, to For them to agree to a deal, go six months, let us run with it. And literally as soon as we start, change their mind. For, for no reason, because there, there was no new information at all. That is just fantastically terrible. Um, 
and no no business relationship should ever have that. When you're in business, you run into everything. I mean, you you literally have every kind of variation happen to you. Earlier that year, we had another client who filed bankruptcy and another company bought them, but since they bought them out of bankruptcy, they didn't owe us any of the money that that company owed us. So basically all they did is say, we're out of business, and then they moved over there and said, totally new thing, same name, same company, same people, but we don't owe you any money. And that was bananas to me. Uh, Because like buying out bankruptcy, they pay... Uh, you, you pay the creditors in order of how you feel like, but whoever the buyer is isn't technically responsible for the company. Um, so they get the trademark, they get all of the company assets without having to take any of the liabilities, which is a hilarious thing with bankruptcy. Um, because you can leave all of your creditors just high and dry. Um, but no, yeah, every situation has occurred, but the very worst situation is that client. Um not only because it's fairly recent, it happened last year, but it was it was quite large. It was just bananas crazy, and there was there was no way to engage with it. Um, but I take deep satisfaction in knowing that they're going to go out of business at some point because th- it is unsustainable. It is an unsustainable way of operating. It's a way to either survive or make a quick buck for a minute, but. The world is so small, guys. As soon as somebody screws somebody, everybody else knows about it. I mean, like, literally, I'm talking about this on a public podcast. Like, there, it's done. I haven't named the person, and I'm not going to, because that's just bad form. I would really like to, because, again, I want to stop this organization from operating. Um, but I can't. It's just, that seems low and beneath us. Um, even... <sighs> I've warned everybody who ever happens to work with them and that kind of stuff, but uh, and I warned all their investors. Um, so there's that. But the good news is that the the organization. I don't know. Comment down below. I I really don't want. I we shouldn't share the name. That that's unprofessional. But in the interest of making sure nobody else works with it, no, that looks like I'm being petty. Um, we're not going to do that. So no, we're not going to share the name, but not today. Not unless somebody can really pitch something good. But yeah, you're going to get, if you're ever in business, you're going to get screwed. So you build in a screw margin uh, into your operations so that it doesn't kill you. You basically have like a rainy day fund to take up. Oh, yep. Just took a hit on that one. Well, we're pulling from the rainy day fund to make ends meet for that whole thing um, or to make us whole from whatever it was. So, um, but, and yeah, if you're a client, be respectful to the time of the manufacturer. And if you're the manufacturer, do the best you can. Um, and make sure if it's a large client that you have as much iron cladding that you can. Um, and I don't know other things to research. Like if there's anything that seems off, make sure it's off and make sure it's settled or locked in. Um, but again, Regardless of how much you put into a contract or anything else, people can still screw you. Like in this situation, they literally just walked away, and the situation was such to where it wasn't worth us to chase worth it to us to chase them down because it would have been more expensive. They would have gone out of business. We would have got nothing. So it's this weird no win scenario where you just got to take it in the teeth and move on with life. But anyhow. Moving on with life. Now we're moving on to cool stuff like we got the Etsy app and all that kind of stuff to where if one guy goes out of business, we got hundreds of others. But like literally, guys, do go out and make something cool. Hopefully the Etsy app and everything else will let you create something really awesome without having to deal with the fear or the pain of having to buy a bunch of machines and run a print farm. Um, It shouldn't be necessary to have to build a factory in order to start a product. Just like it's not necessary to build a server farm to make an app. Um, that's what we're trying to get to build a warehouse where the shelves make the product so that nothing exists until somebody actually orders it. And now creators can create whatever they want, whenever they want. And it's super easy. So have a great day, everybody.